Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast, our first episode of the month of July. Happy to be with you. I am Tyler Donahue. In just a little while, you'll hear from my colleague Tyler Calvaruso, who is our recruiting insider at Lions247.com. He was on a bunch uh, during the month of June as we saw Penn State pick up a variety of commitments. Uh, we saw Penn State host hundreds and actually thousands of prospects on campus over the course of that month. And we had a great conversation coming out of June with Brian Doan. If you missed it, our episode that dropped Thursday on June 29th, I'd suggest going back, check that one out. We had a full hour with 24-7 Sports National Analyst Brian Doan breaking down this current Penn State recruiting class, some of the key decisions that are yet to be made in this 2024 cycle. And he gave his perspective on some of those recent arrivals here on campus, Chim Diono, Carmelo uh, Taylor, and then some of the others who have gotten to campus as freshmen here in just the last couple of weeks. But we begin this episode with one of those June commitments and happened just about a week and a half ago at this point. We welcome him on the podcast, wide receiver Peter Gonzalez out of Central Catholic in Pittsburgh. And Peter, congratulations first and foremost on joining this 2024 Penn State recruiting class. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here. Well, we've got a lot to catch up on. I think the last time you and I uh, were face to face, not virtually, but but on the field at Penn State, you were yet to make your decision. You had a really impressive day at Penn State camp. And I want to talk about that day in just a bit. But let's go back to June 23rd when you made your announcement uh, saying, yeah, Penn State's the choice here. Penn State's the pick. You and Josiah Brown, the top ranked player out of New York, another projected wide receiver, committed essentially in the same minute, uh, a couple yeah. days after Tysir Denmark got the receiver class started. Let's talk about you personally before the group at large. Why was this the right time and why was this the choice? Um, honestly, the camp had a big um, role to play in that. I feel like I, I show what I can do and their interest in me really grew after that camp, after the numbers I posted and all that. Um, it, it's a hometown school for me. Um, my family being able to watch me play is, is very important to me and I feel like the two hour drive isn't bad at all. Um, Coach Terry Smith has been very consistent with me, very honest with me and my family throughout this process, which we value a lot. Um, and then overall, whenever it came down to, to making the decision after the OV, I kind of felt like it was just home and it was a place I can grow. Me and Coach Higgins have, have built a great relationship um, since he's gotten there. And um, I feel like he's a coach that I can really play for and, and I'm excited to be a part of that unit. We were wondering when there was going to be movement at the wide receiver uh, wide receiver class with Coach Higgins coming on board. I think back in, in early February, uh, no commitments until last week and or a couple of weeks ago. And all of a sudden, there's three commitments in this class. What was that like for you? Were you well aware of all the things that were taking place that week, or did anything take you by surprise? Um, no, I was pretty aware. And honestly, me, Tessier, and Josiah, we were on the same, all on the same official visit. Um, so I kind of got to talk to them and get a feel. And I feel, figured we were all on the same page after the OV that. This is a place we want to come to. So I, I was in the loop, uh, especially when me and Josiah announced at the same time. We were kind of texting back and forth, and, and that was super dope to do. But um, I, I think it's it's a great group of guys that I'm super excited to work with. Now, you mentioned the official visit weekend, and that was just the weekend prior. So mm -hmm. at the 72 hours or so before Denmark commits, four or five days before you and, and Brown commit, you said you had a feeling it was working in that direction. Why did you have a feeling? I'm sure you guys weren't outright saying, Here's my plan. I'm definitely going to commit to Penn State. But why were you sensing that it was working in that direction? Honestly, I think it was just the connection, you know, between all the guys there that um, we believed in what Coach Franklin and Coach Hagan were saying. And, and together, that's something we want to be a part of. You know, Penn State's going in a great direction. Um, and we know the receiver was very important to them. So for them to want us like that, um, we all are kind of on the same page that we want to be the difference makers on that team. So um, Tysir actually silent committed on the official. They announced at the dinner, which was pretty awesome. Um, and then me and Josiah kind of on the same page about it. it's going to happen soon. So we knew coming out, we knew by, by Father's Day that that Sunday that that Tysir Denmark was was working his way towards that flip. It took a little while for it to be public. But just to kind of go back to what you said, he made he made everyone aware of it. I mean, we, we had heard that that there was certainly an awareness that he was going to happen. But he actually put it out there during dinner with the official visitors. Yeah. So on the Saturday dinner, he he put Coach Franklin came down. So we got a new Nately Lion. And Tysir worked out with his shirt, and I couldn't be happier for him. Very nice. Now, have you two known each other? Opposite ends of the states, but two of the uh, priority wide receivers in the entire state of Pennsylvania in the same class. Um, we've met before um, at Penn State, actually, during games. But um, just recently, OV is when we really got to talk and connect. Cool. And, and, and I guess I don't know if you've had a chance to really get to know their games much, Josiah and Tysir. But do you see complementary components as you three you know, assemble in this wide receiver class? 
yeah, I think we we all bring different things to the table, which is what Penn State wants and needs um, to really bring that receiver room as a whole. Um, I, I'm a bigger guy. I'm bigger than both of them, which is something they've wanted. But they're quick and they're fast, and that's something they also really wanted. So I feel like we have very complementary skills. You all are going to follow up a one freshman class. Carmelo Taylor was the only scholarship guy to come in at receiver. He got to campus a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we know that Coach Higgins is not done yet with this wide receiver class. And 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 I'm curious what your thoughts on are where it can go from here um, and, and kind of how, how do you feel about that? A guy who is going to want the football when he gets to campus, but also you want that talent around you. You want the competition around you. How are you kind of feeling about this class growing at wide receiver? And what do you think are, are, are kind of the necessary components for whoever does come on board? Yeah, well, I think that competition is necessary. And there are a few guys that um, are pretty close to make that decision. And I'm all for the competition. I feel like it'll make me better and it'll make the team better. Um, and I'm very confident in my skills. So um, whatever, whatever Coach Higgins teaches me, and if I can apply it to the field, I'm confident in my ability. Um but other than that, I feel like it's very necessary for the receiver room to grow because that just helps the team as a whole. I want to go back to, to that first Sunday in June because that was your chance to really be with Coach Higgins in a, in a pretty intimate way. 20 minutes, I think it was, just the two of you and his sons were out there helping out a little bit. But this wasn't just a run of the mill camp you know, operating procedure where you're with a bunch of other campers. What did that extra time with Coach Higgins at the tail end of camp when it was just you, him, his two young sons out there assisting him, do for you and do for your recruitment? It, it kind of just showed me the family side of him and how much he cares as a coach. Um, for him to pull me aside like that and, and spend the time to coach me and work with me, aside from everyone else, really showed me how much he wanted me and wanted to, to coach me as a player. Um, and then his sons being out there helping out, that just showed me how he is as a dad. You know, he, he likes to bring his kids around. My dad was the same way whenever he would coach. He would always bring me around and that was some of the best times of my life, being around the older guys, looking up to him. So seeing that he's doing that with his sons, it just really shows me a lot about him and it's something that I want to I play for. And that was after you put together a strong camp performance. You came in, you tested well, 4-5 range in the 40-yard dash, the athleticism all checked out, and then one-on-one -on -one work, we certainly saw your talent at wide receiver. You mentioned that was a really important kind of pivot day for you with your Penn State recruitment and knowing where you were heading and where you were trending with your decision. What was your mindset regarding Penn State? And what do you think their mind was regarding you before you got to campus that day? Um, my mindset going into Penn State and going to the camp was just showing what I could do. If they want me or they don't want me, I can't control that. But I'm just going to go out there and do what I can do. Um, and for them, I think all they wanted to see was how is my knee. Um, that's been a big question for a lot of coaches. And for them, they, they're very keen on, on seeing someone in person and seeing how they move. Um, and I know I'm close to 100 percent. And I feel like I could go out there and show that. I feel like I did. So. For them, I feel like they got their question answered of he's back. And for me, I feel like I showed them just what I can do. Yeah, you played last year as a junior coming off of a, of a serious knee injury, a torn ACL. You suffered it the previous winter, so the winter after your sophomore season. I think seven months later, you're back on the field. You're competing for, uh, you know, in, in, in varsity action, 730-plus receiving yards, eight touchdowns as a junior. But I know you told me this already – you didn't feel like you rounded into full form uh, last year at, at any point. So how far off were you when the season ended from where you think you could be and, and how pleased with what you were able to accomplish last year? When the season ended, I was probably around 80%. I feel like my body towards the end adjusted to the, to the speed of play and the recovery, but there were still certain movements that off my right knee just weren't very comfortable. I wasn't very comfortable with. Um, so I probably left at about 80%, but just being able to be out there with my team and help out was all I really wanted. Um, if I could go out there and contribute one thing for my team and help us get to a certain place, that's all I really wanted. So I wasn't too worried about me and getting my stats. I was more worried about my team and, and just helping them out because we had some senior guys who have some, some big goals and dreams, and I just want to be a part of helping them. And then leading my class and just being showing I could be a leader on that team. And I'm not going to sit out for myself. I'm going to play for you guys. Well, you got the scholarship offer from Penn State uh, that winter, you know, when, mm -hmm. leading up to the injury. And I know that you had a lot cooking on the recruiting trail before the injury. That happens. You're, you're wiped off of all the, the camp schedules last year. We don't going to see you on seven on sevens. We're not going to see you in any one on one circuits. And then, you know, you're, you're working your way back as the season goes on. What did it do to your recruitment process? Did it kind of put you in a position where you had to, in some ways, reprove yourself as a power five prospect? I think so. It definitely did. And, and when I toured, I actually I had no offer. So in my mind, it was kind of like, man, I got to wait before I can prove myself again. And then luckily I got blessed with some interest. But um, I feel like that that offseason, I really could have shown some things that would have asserted me as deserving of what I got. But um, God has his timing and I feel like I, I proved it in my right time and I ended up where I was supposed to be. But 
there was definitely some more on the table if I don't have that knee injury. Well, Penn State was one of the schools that did offer, uh, you know, during that. What was their kind of message to you when they're targeting a player who's you know, not able to show what they're able to do and, and showcase that physically? What's the message from Franklin and the staff and trying to figure out each other when you're recovering from an injury? Yeah, so we kind of kept it uh, pretty low early on, but just with the connection between us and Coach Smith, um, we told him and he said he's going to recruit me just the same. Um, he, he believes in what I can do as a player and and he knows that this happens to a lot of guys and a lot of guys can come back from it. So he's been very consistent throughout the whole process. There were some other coaches who just f for all the right reasons were concerned about it because some guys don't come back from it. But um, Coach Smith was very consistent and open and honest about what they were all talking about. And when I came on and I could prove it and, and kind of proved him right, I, I think that really kind of solidified it. Was there a specific spot on, on your timeline, whether it was last fall or maybe this this offseason now, where you said, the, 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 I'm back, I'm back, and maybe then some. You know, now you feel like it's in the rearview mirror for you, like like and drifting back there, not not something that's kind of lurking over your shoulder and, and waiting to slow you down. Yeah, I feel like at the UC camp is kind of when I figured that, that I'm here and I'm back. It was a rainy day, kind of dreary, and I, and I still felt like I was moving very uh, fluidly. And then we got to the testing. I put up some good numbers there. I ran a 449 on the laser. And it was kind of my moment of like, I'm back and I'm better. You know, I, I've been working. I've been trying to get back. And I'm not only where I was, but I, I'm ahead of where I was. So um, just that moment was very comforting for me that, that all my hard work has paid off. And then I think maybe three weeks later is, is when you're in State College for, for the camp here with Penn State. Um, when, when you finish up that and, and you get in the car and, and you head home with mom and dad, who I know they were watching every moment of, of your workout with Coach Hagan's, did it feel like the just the, the way you were all thinking, discussing Penn State was a little bit different than maybe the car ride over to campus that day? Most definitely. I think after the camp and just seeing how everything was, the – the tone was a little different and, and more trending in the direction of that being a place I want to play. So um, I, I, that was spot on with the conversation being a little different. You, you gave Terry Smith a lot of credit in your recruitment here a couple of times already during our interview. Uh, and I think a lot of people say, well, wide receiver, they're going to focus in on the wide receiver position. They're going to think, OK, stubble field, then Hagen's. But you mentioned Smith being the consistent presence. I, obviously, I think people know his background as a player, as a coach in Western Pennsylvania. Can you talk about what he means, I guess, in your recruitment, but also what you gather he means in that region as a presence for Penn State? Well, I think for him, he's a proven coach. Um, Penn State's been held as DBU a few times. So I feel like as a coach, he's very improved. And then just the connection through the Whippeal. Um, he takes a lot of pride in the guys that he recruits from here. He's not just going to recruit anybody. He's going to um, really put his time and effort into the people he believes in because he sent some guys out from this area that have gone on to do great things and, and he believes in the area here um so just that belief and and the kind of connection we had in that aspect was was very helpful in the process and um it made me feel very comfortable that when i get there i'll have someone in the room who, who can relate to me and knows what i'm going for and kind of have an advocate you know you obviously also have uh, an advocate in, in, in football because your dad has that background of football and you have an advantage that not a lot of recruits do when they encounter all the power five options and what's going to lie ahead. Uh, your father carved out a great career with Pitt, uh, obviously remembered well by Panthers fans, probably a little bit differently by Penn State fans over here. What's yeah. that whole dynamic over there? I know he was, you know, he was letting you lead the recruitment where you wanted, but how how helpful was it, I suppose, to have him as a sounding board along the way to figure out maybe what's right and what's BS uh, yeah. based on everything you're hearing? No, it was super helpful. I mean, just the way he would teach me how to go on visits and, and kind of analyze everything and how to talk to coaches and, and do interviews, just the things like that that a lot of kids don't have. It was something that was a huge blessing to me, and, and it's just kind of helped me throughout this process to figure out where I want to go. You know, a lot of guys – get caught up in like the flashy lights and, and what coaches put out. But he kind of taught me that you got to look deeper into it. Um, and I feel like that's what really helped me come down to the few schools I had and then ultimately make my decision was just his guidance of not getting caught up in all the bells and whistles, but really looking at is this a place I can go and, and want to play for. And and I'm sure when your name initially popped up as a, as a prospect to know in the area, people saw, oh, Peter Gonzalez, this is the son of Pete Gonzalez. OK, he's going to end up at Pitt. Has there been any kind of awkward nature to that aspect of it uh, around the community uh, anyway, especially now that you're, you're heading east to play for the Nittany Lions? Yeah, I mean, in my close circles, everyone's just happy for me and the decision I made. I, I've seen some comments and some people put some things out about um, Pitt and all that, but I don't really look at it. I feel like I made the right decision for me. And um, Pitt was always a place I, I, I watched growing up and, and was always very cool. Um, but when the process came along, I just more gravitated towards Penn State just based on the, the recruiting that the schools did. 
Now, all due respect to Pete and Peter, the intel I got on the Gonzalez family is mom is the athlete of the household. Is that accurate? She she is a very good athlete. She was a volleyball player in college, so I have credit a lot of my athleticism to her as much as my dad hates to hear it. <laughs> well, hey, it's a good combination. And, and speaking of your athleticism, what what's kind of on the table for you between now and when you get back on that football field in September? I know you've got preseason camp coming up, but it feels like this is uh, your first opportunity in two years to fully ramp up for what should be a normal season and a highly anticipated one for you where you're going to have that bullseye on your back as a Power 5 prospect. I, I just couldn't be more excited to get out there at 100%. I feel like being able to play with this team we got coming back with a lot of guys who – already bought into what we're doing, I couldn't be more excited to get out there. And I know there's going to be people coming for me, people on my back, but I know what I can do, and I'm very confident in my ability to step up to the challenge. So I'm honestly just excited to get out there back on Friday Night Lights and play with my boys. When people look back at maybe your huddle film from last season and they're trying to get kind of figure out who Peter Gonzalez is, I keep saying when we write about, when we talk about you on the podcast, you know, evaluate 2022 you know with the caveat that he's coming off an injury how do you think we're gonna see a different Peter Gonzalez here in 2023 come September October November I think the biggest thing is gonna be speed and explosiveness I feel like I was very cautious on my knee last year which makes me look a little slower in the film but I feel like this year being on 100 percent you're gonna see some explosion that I haven't been able to put on film because sophomore year I was young junior year I was fighting back from an injury but this year I'm ready to go can we talk about a couple of your future teammates and, and start with one current teammate, uh, Anthony Specka, of course, who, who, who got into this class well before you back in the winter, linebacker, a guy that you're going to be uh, competing with here for the next several months and then sev uh, several years down the road. What, what's the scouting report on who Specka is as a linebacker and who he is as a locker room presence? Um, as a linebacker, I think he's just a freak athlete. He gets to some places that I don't even know his physicality is through the roof. He'll, he'll plug a hole and make a tackle and, um, he does some things that scare me a little bit, just the intensity he plays with. But um, on the field, he, he's very unstoppable. And, and then as a locker room president, he, he's, a, he's a fellow leader. Um, he's a guy that people respect and gravitate towards and is very motivated to, to accomplish everything us or as, a, as seniors want to accomplish. So um, I feel like he's on the same page and is very goal-driven towards what we all want to accomplish. How was he with you leading up to your commitment for those few months? I mean, was he a guy who every day he's going at it? Maybe every week he's reminding you what's up with Penn State? How was he as a peer recruiter? He, he was the type to kind of drop little hints here and there. You know, he, he knew that the decision would come down to what's best for me, but he also wanted me to come, come play with him. So he wouldn't be too hard on it, but he would definitely sprinkle in here and there some hints that, hey, why don't you come over? Peter, something we've seen uh, increasing popularity is January enrollees uh, from across the country getting Happy Valley to get a jump on, on their career, get that spring ball in. We talked about it before you recorded. You and Anthony are in an interesting situation at Central Catholic where historically the early enrollment, that early graduation thing isn't on the table. But you mentioned that that you guys may be trying to make a difference and impact there. Are you saying don't count you out completely just yet for maybe getting to campus a little earlier? Yeah, I think based on the amount of guys that we have looking for that, um, besides me and Spec, Cole Sullivan going to Michigan and Ty Uhas going to Pitt, we got a few more guys than most classes have had looking for that option, especially given how popular it's become. Um, so I feel like all of us being good students and being able to get done what we need to get done for that to happen, um, we're going to try and appeal to the school in some way to see if that's a possibility. And obviously having that, that foundation to stand on and saying, hey, look what I've done as a scholar here. Look what I've already gotten accomplished in the classroom. But I'm curious, what would you benefit as a college student, as a college athlete, if you were to get that green light, get on campus in January 2024 versus, say, June 2024? I just think the adjustment of high school to college is very difficult. Um, but the earlier you can get it done, the better it is going in. Um, just having the time to build rapport with your teammates in the locker room over, over winter and spring training is, is huge. Um, the being able to be on the weightlifting program and the diet program and just getting your body in more college shape. You've seen some of the guys in the freshman class who over the last six months have completely transformed. So being able to do that in that area, I feel like is very big, especially if your goal is to play early. The other future teammate I wanted to ask you about because you had a chance to play with him back in, in, in June at camp was Ethan Grunkemeyer, your future quarterback at Penn State. He's a guy who's on the rise in 24-7 sports rankings after the Elite 11 finals, up to number 200 in the country, a four-star prospect. And I'm curious what you took away from that experience. I know he was kind of chirping at you about, hey, let's do this for the next few years. Yeah. What did you get for, from, from throwing the ball around with him a little bit and just kind of seeing how he interacts with his receiver and with offensive coordinator Mike Yersich out there on the field? 
Yeah, I, I think he's just a player. Like, he just steps up to the plate and does what he has to do. Um, he's not too flashy with it, but he doesn't have to be. He throws a nice ball, and whenever we stepped up, we just had that connection immediately, which I think was huge, um, given that this is going to be my quarterback for the next four years, four or five years. Um, and then just as a person, he's a cool guy. You know, it, it was – we clicked instantly when we started talking. You know, there was no weird weird vibe. It, it was just, hey, we're on the same page, and we're cool, so let's go out there and let's ball. All right, let's finish this conversation with how your you know, your first interaction uh, at that camp, and that was James Franklin at the registration table. You're showing up for camp, and he made it very clear that he would be watching you closely and that I think you've said recruit the hell out of you. So tell me when a coach like James Franklin – it makes you a priority that day and you deliver. What was that like? And what did you, what did James Franklin's message early on mean, mean to you overall? Um, honestly, it, it was, it was very big for me. Um, I think when any player gets a coach of that caliber to come and say, Hey, we believe in you and we just want to see it. Um, that gives you a confidence boost. And for me, it kind of took the weight off my shoulder of, of, Hey, I got to come out here and I got it. Like just the nerves that come with it. I feel like, you know what? I can calm down. They're going to be watching, but I just got to do what I do. And then afterwards, when we had a conversation, he said, you earned it, which was very big to me that um, I came off an injury. I had some questions. And, and when they wanted me to come to camp and deliver, I delivered. Um, and just hearing that from him saying that I earned it is huge. And I feel like gives a different level of respect for me as a recruit that, that I'm willing to come out here and show what I can do. How did you deliver the, the commitment to James Franklin? I, I know that you put it out publicly at 7 p.m. on a Friday on social media. But how did you do it with that staff? Yeah, so Saturday night before dinner, um, he called me into the office, and it was Coach Hagens, Coach Cal, Slant, like just a bunch of guys in the room. Um, and he was just asking, so what are you thinking? And with my parents in the room, I told him, I, I want to commit here. I want to play for Penn State. And then after that, everyone got up, shared some hugs, and then we had some good dinner. So you're saying by the time James Franklin puts his head down on the pillow Saturday night, you're on board, Denmark's on board, and Josiah Brown's moving in that direction as well. It all gets done five days later publicly, but just a reminder of how much is happening behind the scenes this time of year. Hey, Peter Gonzalez, really excited to, to learn more about you, get to know you in the coming years, but you've got work to do at Central Catholic as a senior, so excited to see you this fall back in action. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right, great stuff. Talk to you soon. Peter Gonzalez, remember that 2024 class, which has changed rapidly. They're up to 21 total commitments, a top 10 unit overall when you look at the 24-7 sports rankings. And to take a closer look at the latest edition and what might be happening here in the coming days, we bring on board Tyler Calvaruso, our recruiting insider at lines247.com. Tyler, how you doing? Doing well, man. It feels good to be back on the air with you. Yeah, we uh, you have a tough act to follow. Uh, you know, Peter Gonzalez, no surprise, fantastic conversation. Learned a lot more about him and his path to Penn State and what he's got cooking at Central Catholic as a senior. But we followed that, uh, where we followed uh, up a Brian Dome conversation on Thursday that featured a ton of, of recruiting intel. One of those big names that, that Brian was looking ahead to when he was working through the upcoming commitments was DeAndre Cook. And that commitment has come and it has gone to Penn State. That occurred on Friday. So let's begin there, Tyler Calvaruso. What do we make of the 21st member of this 2024 class and one that's going to impact the defensive front for Deion Barnes? I remember when Penn State first offered DeAndre Cook, there was some speculation that it might just be making a move to get closer in with Dylan Stewart. With those two playing together at Friendship Collegiate Academy, you know, Stewart being one of the top edge rushers in the 2024 class, a guy who was high on the Penn State board at that point in time. But it, that was never the case. Penn State always really liked Cook for who he was as a player. And really, as the cycle has progressed, he has steadily moved up the defensive line board, and that culminated in a commitment last week. I think that, you know, at this point in the cycle where you're looking to add on the interior, Cook gives Penn State a lot of what it is looking for when it's coming to adding interior defensive linemen. You know, he's, he plays pretty aggressively. He's got an impressive frame where he could add weight and, you know, play bigger than he is right now. So this is something that the staff is really excited about to get Cook on board. And, you know, there's a lot of been a lot of movement on the defensive line when it comes to targets going elsewhere and targets closing in on a commitment. Cook was one of the first ones, you know, that busy stretch of commitments coming up for Penn State. He was the first one to pop, and it wound up going in Penn State's favor. So Deion, Bourne's, Deion Barnes is on board with his second defensive line commitment in this class. 
listed six foot four, 260 pounds at 24 seven sports out of friendship collegiate Academy, the number 79 defensive lineman right now with an 87 rating that puts him in a uh, three-star category. And Tyler, uh, look, it wasn't all good news on the defensive line for Penn state in the recent days. Uh, one of the premier Pennsylvania prospects coming off the board, not to the Nittany lions as we forecast on our last episode. No, David Polly Polly going off the board to USC. Picked the Trojans over Penn State and Michigan. It was an interesting month with David Polly Polly. You know, back in May, late May, it was looking like Michigan was in a really good spot. I put in the crystal ball pick in favor of the Wolverines. Polly Polly makes it to Penn State for his official visit during the first weekend of June. Things went really well there. You know, we heard that he came pretty close to committing at one point that weekend, but he still went on to make it to Michigan. And it seemed like the Michigan staff had received similar positive indications that some more crystal ball picks went in in favor of the Wolverines from those in our network. And it looked like that one was going to get done in favor of Jim Harbaugh and his staff in Ann Arbor. But Polly Polly, who grew up a USC fan, makes it out to Southern California for his official visit. And, I mean, they really just blew him away. At the end of the day, it just came down to USC having a more complete package to offer Poly Poly than Penn State and Michigan. That's really what it was. You know, it seemed like at one point proximity was going to be a pretty big deal for Poly Poly. And Penn State had a leg up in that regard, obviously, with his family living in Pennsylvania. But, you know, he grew up in Alaska. He has family on the West Coast. USC, as I mentioned, is a program that he grew up rooting for. Honestly, it wouldn't even surprise me if his family winds up relocating out there because that's a really tight-knit group. So this is just one that, you know, you win some, you lose some. Penn State lost this one. Well, I guess uh, when it comes to, I guess, balancing the the additions and subtractions on this class, I know uh, Pale Pale is one that people felt like was kind of, you know, being reeled into the boat, I guess you could say, the last couple of weeks, and then it, it didn't happen that way. Whereas Cook, I think, you know, less drama involved there, uh, a little bit more neat and tidy, doesn't have the same offer sheet. How would you kind of compare and contrast these two talents? It's a good question because I think they're kind of, you know, first of all, just in terms of their recruitments, they're on complete opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, Polly Polly was, there were points in the cycle where there were questions about where he was at in the Penn State board and how much he's been prioritized. And he obviously wound up being a priority for the staff and winds up going elsewhere. Cook was kind of more on that upward trajectory throughout the cycle in terms of where he stood on the board, just, you know, steadily moving up. And by the time June rolled around, he was a priority target for the staff. And it was pretty clear that they were prepared to take him in and walk him into the class if that's what he decided that he wanted to do. Cook and Polly Polly, skill set-wise, are a little bit different. You know, Polly Polly's body type, he's already kind of had – he kind of has that mess that Cook is going to look to put on. He's, he's strong. I really like Polly Polly's game. I think that's a really good get – for USC, but you watch some tape on DeAndre Cook. I mean, like I said, he, he plays physically, so you know that's not going to be an issue. He's not one of those softer interior defensive linemen. He's got that toughness in him, so that's something the Penn State staff likes. He's pretty quick off the ball, so that's a plus. And you know, get, the, I mean, he can get vertical. I think for an does. interior guy, you he can does. see him. You know, not often. You, know, you can see guys kind of be a space eater at the high school level, use that brute force. Right now, I think he's a little. If he's kind of leaning on anything a little too much, it probably is that ability to get vertical and use his speed rush because that ain't going to play in the Big Ten trenches. But right now. When you see that, and that's kind of how you want to work in this defensive talent, I think you want to work guys in from the perimeter on in versus from inside out to the perimeter. I think he kind of fits that trajectory. He does, and that's kind of the contrast between him and Polly Polly because Polly Polly at this point in his career, he is that space eater already as an interior defensive lineman. He is that run-stuffing space eater. Cook's a little bit different. I think there's a little bit more versatility there. And like you said, I mean, he's kind of transitioning more into becoming more of an interior, true interior defensive lineman. He's not going to be able to rely on some of the same moves that get him wins against opposing offensive linemen. Now he's going to have to adapt a little bit in the Big Ten, and I think that's something that he's prepared to do, and the staff likes the projection there. So two different kinds of players. You know, Penn State gets Cook. USC gets Poly Poly. Both programs get what they were looking for. So Cook joined Xavier Gilliam in the defensive line class so far. Gilliam was one of those early June commitments back on June 4th, uh, defensive lineman out of Wild Lake in Columbia, Maryland. Uh, but when we kind of assess what's next, it's hard not to land on what has been a bit of a sore subject of late at Lions 24-7 because ben Benedict Ume is about to announce here in the coming days 
Uh, Stanford is the trendy pick in the crystal ball right now. Uh, preceding that, Penn State was the trendy pick in the crystal ball. I think Brian Doan did a fantastic job laying this one out, why it is where it is, and why he felt differently a couple weeks ago on our last episode of the podcast. So, Calvaruso, not asking you to rehash the Benedict Ume situation, but is there any room for hope there, or are we pretty much thinking that Penn State is moving forward and Benedict Ume is moving west? I think Penn State's moving forward with, you know, it's focused elsewhere at this point in the cycle. I think the writing is on the wall when it comes to where Ume will land. And but you just said it, man. I mean, Brian did a great job of laying out why things were a certain way a couple of weeks ago and why they are the way they are now. Penn State did a really good job of Benedict Ume on his official visit, right? This wasn't an instance where Penn State gets him on campus and the staff underwhelmed. It definitely wasn't that because it just seemed like the staff did such a good job of pitching the balance between academic in football and how Ume could play a really high level of football at Penn State and in the Big Ten. And it seemed like that mixture and that balance was enough of a selling point for Ume and his family to comfortably say that the Nittany Lions were leading and trending and, you know, possibly inching closer to receiving some good news on the commitment front. That Stanford official visit just always concerned me because when you spend so much time during a cycle talking about how much a kid emphasizes academics and how important it is and how much he loves the academic side of the college experience. I mean, if he has a Stanford official visit coming up, it's hard to ignore it. I know it's a running joke on our board with the Stanford degree, but I mean, <laughs> it, it is what you, it is. You, like, you have it, been consistently saying that. I feel like every time you've mentioned Benedict Dume since the blue white game, you said, but he's going to visit Stanford. So let's see what happens there. Yeah, and so, right. yeah, I'll give you the credit where credit is due on that subject. There's no doubt about it. No, it just always had that feeling where I wanted to at least see how that visit would play out before jumping in on the crystal ball. And I was positive on Ume coming out of that Penn State official visit because it did seem like the Nittany Lions were the favorite, and it was going to take a very good visit to Stanford to change that. That visit happened, and that's why Stanford is the crystal ball favorite right now, and that's why I expect the Cardinal to receive some good news from Ume when he announces his decision on July 8th. Yeah, that's a July 8th decision, but July 8th could still bring yep. growth for this Penn State class because Malachi Williams, as we go from one defensive lineman to another, both considered four stars in the composite. Uh, Malachi Williams in state at a Monsignor Bonner to the east side of the state. And and, and when we kind of size this one up, as, I, as Brian Doan and I got a pretty good laugh out uh, con, con, and con, conversing about this, a lot of people thought this was done. A lot of people are so surprised we're talking about him here in July. Thought it was going to be one of those June commitments. That didn't happen. But certainly room to believe that positive uh, momentum has sustained into another month. Yeah, I would have been right there laughing with you guys. I thought this was going to be done a month ago, too. It's, it had that read for a little bit. But Williams decided, hey, look, I'm going to finish out June. I'm going to take my remaining visits. I'm going to make it to Syracuse. I'm going to make it to Pittsburgh. And I'm going to make a decision based on the feedback that I received from those trips in addition to the feedback that I received from the Penn State trip. And that Penn State trip set such a high bar. It was going to be really tough for Syracuse and Pittsburgh to, you know, really challenge that. I'm not sure they did during those official visits. Credit to those programs for getting Williams in town and, you know, going through its pitch and doing all they could to lure him. But I, I just got the feeling that this is going to be a Penn State win in the end. I'm, I think it would take a pretty significant line of thinking change from Williams and the Williams camp for that to go differently. I think this is one Penn State fans should feel pretty good about on July 8th. So we talked about win some, lose some earlier. I think July 8th might be one of those days where that happens. Well, we'll see uh, out of uh, Delaware County's uh, Monsignor Bonner High School, uh, Malachi Williams set to make his decision. The other uh, on the board announcement that we're looking at here is July 7th. And this is another one that much like the Pale Pale announcement is, in a different place than it was in, say, mid-June. Nick Marsh, former Michigan State commit, top 24-7 wide receiver prospect. I think there was some putting his name in pencil in this 2024 recruiting class during some stages of early summer. Tyler Calvaruso, I know the pendulum has swung for you in how you read this recruiting with Penn State. Uh, Nick Marsh, this Friday, coming off the board to somebody. Yeah, I don't expect it to be Penn State at this point. I just feel like, again, where we talked about Ben McDuman, that Stanford official visit looming large. I think that Michigan State official visit loomed really large with Nick Marsh. I think, you know, being committed to the Spartans for almost a year, I believe it was either nine or 10 months that he was committed before he decided to reopen things and explore his options elsewhere. It just that kind of relationship. And I know that it's kind of rare when a recruit backs off a commitment. I, I mean, we've seen it. With Penn State, Mega Bornwell wound up back in the class. Granted, he's on better example for you. Better yeah. example for you. Micah Parsons did it. 
That, that is, that, that, yeah, that is yeah, a yeah, much a better, better example. Yeah. Like, you definitely got me there. But then with Marsh, it's just, you know, Michigan State feels like home to Marsh and a lot of people in his family. I think that definitely helps the Spartans. I mean, I still hear Pittsburgh being tossed around to some degree. So I'm not quite sure a final decision has been made yet. I haven't received any indication that it has. But I know I have the crystal ball pick in for Penn State. I'm not feeling too good about it. At this point, I do think it's going to be Michigan State when Nick Marsh announces on July 7th, but we'll see. I mean, it's July 3rd right now, so we got three more full days before Nick Marsh comes to a decision. We'll see what happens between now and then, but I think Michigan State reels them back in, and that's going to be a really, really good get for Mel Tucker and his staff. I really like Nick Marsh's skill set as a big-body wideout throughout the cycle. I think he's going to be a really good player at the next level. I think he has a chance to be a really good player at the next level. So if that works in Michigan State's favor, they're getting a pretty good player. That's why Penn State prioritized him so heavily throughout the cycle. Even when Nick Marsh was originally committed to Michigan State, he remained Penn State's top wide receiver target. That was the case when Taylor Stubblefield was in place as the wide receivers coach. That remained the case when Marcus Higgins replaced him. There wasn't really a shakeup at the top when it came to Nick Marsh. And I think that just speaks to the overall evaluation that the Penn State staff has had of him for so long. So we'll see what happens on the seventh. But right now, if I had to pick, it would be Michigan state. Well, they did get a big bodied receiver and, and, and Peter Gonzalez, who we just heard from. And he told yes. us, look, we've got three guys on board. We're excited about a receiver, but the job's not done yet. He knows it's going to be a bigger class. It sounds like we're, we're pushing Marsh to the side. We can maybe officially do that in a few days. Where else is Penn State seriously looking now that we've come out of the uh, four consecutive official visit weekends and all these camps and you got a bunch of stuff, moving parts and guys committing elsewhere? The dust is starting to settle. I'm not going to say it's settled by any means, maybe for a couple more weeks, but where do we need to place our focus at wide receiver as Penn State continues to do its diligence there? Harley Gilmore took his official visit during the final weekend of June. I still think that one's going to be Kentucky at this point. Chance Robinson still in play, a top 24-7 Miami wideout commit. You know, as long as he remains committed to Miami, I think Penn State's going to have a chance. But I still like Florida more than Penn State to get that one done. If Robinson decides, hey, I want to make a move, reopen things, look elsewhere, I think Florida's in the best position to close that. Penn State's definitely still in that mix, though. And they got him on campus for an official visit during the first weekend of June. Went pretty well, but we're going to have to see if he even decides he wants to move off that Miami commitment because we've been speculating for a while that it's a possibility, and it still hasn't happened. You know, he made it to Coral Gables for an official visit during the final weekend of June, it seems like things are really well there. So it's not a guarantee he even moves off the Canes, right? But we'll be keeping an eye on Robinson throughout the remainder of the cycle. Jonathan Paler, you know, top 24-7 athlete from Carolinas. I mean, he's, you know, again, the door is open for him to visit in July. I think if that visit occurs during the last bash weekend, you know, during the final weekend of the month, I think maybe at that point we can start to take him a little bit more seriously. 24-7 sports crystal ball reads 100% in favor of South Carolina right now, last I checked. So I believe that's still the case. Maybe it changes by the time this podcast gets posted. You know how things are in the recruiting industry with how fluid things are. But I think the Gamecocks are going to be tough to beat there. But, again, we'll see if he makes it back to campus in late July. So I remember during the winter, me and you were talking about the wide receiver board and just how wide open it was and how many names we had to sort through and just, you know, kind of seeking some clarity on where things were at. And we definitely have more of that clarity now with Tyser Denmark and Josiah Brown and Peter Gonzalez committed. So that's three on board, but there's still a lot going on. The board is smaller now in terms of names, but there's still a lot going on. Yeah. And, and those are, that's a good trio to be working with yes, right now on, on the third is. day of July. And, and, I, and I'm just thinking about with a, a fresh, uh, you know, a fresh guy leading this position room, got to campus and, 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 and you know, later on the, in the winter, it wasn't like he was here in December, I, this is a position that I personally will be monitoring closely when we get into September. I think this is an area where you look at a senior player, maybe mm-hmm. a few senior players who ball out that are already on Marcus Hagan's radar. I'm probably not talking about a guy that the staff has no idea about right now in July, but there's a list beyond your list of offers, and you're well aware of that, Tyler Calvary. So that list is where I'm very intrigued with at wide receiver of all spots. I could see them you know, trying to coordinate an in, in, in season to, to early December kind of official visit where you get a guy on campus, make your move with him pretty quickly, try to find a player on the way up during his senior year. Um, I think they kind of did that with Cam Wallace last year at running back. They got a guy out of a rural area. Maybe you can go find someone like that again because they're, they're late bloomers in rural areas. But I'm kind of eyeing that up, at, whether it's a fourth or fifth wide receiver that ends up being in this class. 
um, thinking that there's a guy who doesn't yet carry a scholarship offer from Penn State that we're going to be breaking down his profile come the third week of December about a signee with Penn State. So that's kind of where my head's there. And feel free to push back against me, but that's kind of where I am right now. And, And we're in a window, by the way, right now where staffers are on vacation players are announcing commitments, players are gathering the the data they collected from their visits in June. So we're in a little bit of a holding pattern in the recruiting world right now. And I think the next stage of that process, when you start to see these boards really impacted after all these early July commitments, will be when new offers go out after maybe that first three, four week sample period of a senior season. Yeah, I'm I'm aligned with you in that line of thinking. I definitely think that there's potential for a late riser to jump out once the fall rolls around. I actually just forgot to mention Alex Taylor, top 24-7, who made his official visit late. Well, not late, but in the middle of June. He took June 20th to get to campus. We saw saw him riding shotgun with James Franklin around camp last Wednesday, uh, getting getting that one-on-one treatment that you get when you're a midweek visitor, like Brian Robinson, the edge rusher, a couple weeks earlier, and Alex Taylor got it, and he told Brian Doan that – that made an impression that made some movement, the top 24-7 town out of North Carolina. And I'm glad you referenced him because you're right. He was one of the last guys who got here in June. You know, I think that's a improvement that's actually going to be pretty interesting moving forward. Because I think if Penn State really starts to ramp things up and, you know, makes it a hot pursuit leading up to Alex Taylor's July 29th decision, I mean, maybe it's enough to get him out of the Carolinas. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility because his midweek official visit, it did go very well. And I think that individual attention, I think that really worked in Penn State's favor in this situation. I think the reason for that was Alex Taylor had never been to Penn State before. So I think that as opposed to being in a group, him and getting that one-on-one time with the staff and being able to look around and you know do things on a more intimate basis – I think that was something that actually really, really helped Penn State in this situation. So, Taylor, I, you know, I think things could get interesting down the stretch. Will it be enough in the end? We'll see. But I think Penn State now, if it decides it really wants to go full throttle, I think Alex Taylor leading up to that July 29th date that I mentioned, we might be talking about him a little bit more seriously in play. All right, we'll keep tabs on that because while the start of July, apart from these commitment dates, they they matter, they're important, but there's a lot, again, kind of holding in place, a bit of a pause in the recruiting calendar. But late July, you've got that commitment to look forward to. We've got Lash Bash. We've got uh, they wrap up uh, the prospect camps here in Happy Valley. So we're not done with all that kind of stuff yet. We're just waiting for that to ramp back up toward the tail end of this month. And with that in mind, as we look back at at the busy June that was Tyler Calvary. So I had a a couple different categories I wanted you to try to come up with a name for from those June commitments. The guys who came on board, starting with that first Sunday of June, all the way through the last week of June, uh, the last day, the last couple of days of June with the uh, with Cook. Who was, in your opinion, the most impressive or your favorite pickup for this class? I'm talking about a guy that you think makes the biggest long term impact for this program as things stand now in July 2023. For me, it's an easy answer, and the answer is DeWan Lane. You know, I think uh, when uh, when Lane committed and we talked about impact and what he could bring, you know, the old adage when it comes to discussion among Penn State fans is, can this kid help us beat the Michigans and the Ohio States of the world? Mm. And I think DeWan Lane is actually one of those players. I definitely think he could be a guy that helps Penn State get to that point of beating Michigan and Ohio State and doing it consistently. I think he's got that kind of talent. You know, DeWan Lane is one of those guys who – couple years down the road you look at where he's at in his career and you're playing in a big game he might not be you know a heavy rotation player yet on the back end of Anthony Poindexter and Terry Smith's secondary but I mean he might be one of those guys who comes in and makes one or two plays that really propels Penn State to a big win whether it be an interception playing over the top in coverage whether it be a big hit down around the line of scrimmage where he forces a fumble and Penn State generates a turnover and the tide turns Dwan Lane has shown throughout his high school career that he could do both of those things and he could be a multifaceted tool at safety. Granted, he'll be a bigger safety, kind of in the mold of the Corey Nelson, not exactly the same player, but measurably they're very similar. And I think that Penn State likes that in Lane. They like that bigger body in the secondary. So it's got to be Dwan Lane for me, man. I, I just love this kid. He's been one of Penn State's top targets throughout the cycle. You know, even though his recruitment was on the quieter side, there was never any doubt about where he stood on the Penn State board in terms of prioritization. He was up there. The staff was really, really hyped to get this one done. And I think Dewan Lane, he might be one of the best players to come out of this class when it's all said and done. We're revisiting this a couple years down the road. 
Yeah, four-star safety prospect out of Gilman High School in Baltimore, Maryland. And I can tell you, Brian Doan uh, went on and on about this guy for a while on our last episode of this podcast as well. Uh, very, very quiet recruitment, but a very, very loud prospect profile, yes. a guy that Penn State was excited to land. And I'm with you. I'm, bright, I'm glad you brought up the Kari Nelson because when you look at the measurables, there, there's obviously some lines to, to connect between those two prospects. But I would just qualify him, again, much like we qualified the Kari Nelson, chess piece he's a chess yep. piece and when exactly. you have a mind like when you have a mind like Manny Diaz I think we all know there's no guarantees that that you're getting more seasons out of Manny Diaz as your defensive coordinator here but when you've got a mind like his and, and you know whoever Penn State's gonna have a defensive coordinator you find the best 11 and you're not necessarily always looking for only two safeties and you're not only looking for three safeties sometimes and so Takari Nelson's a guy that we said there's not a starting job for him right now I don't even know if there's a too deep job for him right now. It's hard to even see that, but because of who he is as a potential chess piece and because of what a defensive mind like Manny Diaz can do with a chess piece against a high quality opponent, whether it's uh, in October, whether it's early in the season, or whether you're trying to spring a trap in November, these are the kind of players who can get that done. And I, I think it's a great choice with Lane. I'll, I'm a little surprised he didn't jump on one of those wide receivers, but I think safety is a really good spot to go with Lane and let's go underrated. That's the other one I wanted to say. Not necessarily by 24-7 sports right now, although I think there's a few guys that may fit the bill as we've discussed, but just generally maybe didn't went a little too undetected by the Penn State faithful here in the month of June. It was busy. What's a commitment that happened and maybe didn't get the kind of reaction it should have? See, it got a lot of real it got a lot of reaction for me, but I still think Peter Gonzalez is that guy just mm. because I still don't think we've really seen Peter Gonzalez for who he is as a wideout. And, you know, I got the chance to hear some of the back end of your conversation with him. And great job, by the way, as always. But, I mean, he kind of laid it out. I mean, it's been my line of thinking with him for a while. You know, when he was an underclassman, he was still developing and he still wasn't as explosive as he would like to be. Then obviously he suffers the knee injury as he was coming along in his development. That kind of, you know, put a pause on things for him. Then he gets back as a junior. And while he wasn't, you know, he was still working his way back from the ACL and he was still getting back to 100% being, to being in complete game shape and where he wants to be. I think, I mean, just based on the testing numbers and based on how well he ran during the spring and based on the evaluation and the feedback that I've received from the Penn State staff on Peter Gonzalez, I think there's just a lot of really untapped potential there that he's still getting to. I don't think we've really seen his ceiling as an athlete yet. And I don't think we're close to seeing his ceiling as an athlete. I think there's a lot there for a guy who plays at his size. You know, you mentioned Nick Marsh is a big body wild. Peter Gonzalez is that guy as well. And he's, an impressive athlete. I think that there's still a lot left on the table for him that Penn State fans maybe haven't seen yet or they haven't recognized yet. So while he's definitely received a lot of attention from us, there's no doubt about that. He's received a lot of attention throughout June. I mean, he was a focal point for us, really, when he makes it to that first elite showcase camp. And from that point on, it was very clear about how much he was wanted in this class and where he was at on the wide receiver board. It was very clear that he was a priority for the staff. So we talked about him a bunch. So he might not be underrated in that sense. In that sense, I'd probably give it to Josiah Brown because he kind of, you know, he was a guy we talked about a lot early in the cycle. But as things went on, he was kind of just there as the top target. He kind of faded from the conversation. His spot on the board never faded, but in conversation wise, I think he faded a little bit. But skill set wise, I still think Gonzalez is that guy. I, was, I think in some regard, really, all three of the wildouts that they have on board now are underrated to some degree or in some categorization. Because, I mean, we've talked about Tysier's Denmark, his ranking. We've talked about yeah. his ranking on here and how we, we thought it might, you know, I think there's justification for it being a little bit higher. So I think if you could, lay, you put, could put all three of those guys in different categories of underrated. Well, it's interesting because I believe I'm double checking it right now. Josiah Brown, yeah, he's the he is the top rated out of these three in 24/7. Yeah, he is. He's a, he's a top 24/7 guy. He's a four star guy. But I would argue that he's probably the third best wide receiver that you're going to see on the field this fall, just in terms of who they are as a rounded out wide receiver right, right, prospect. Yeah. Josiah Brown is a big time athlete, and I, and I and there's nothing to take away. He's going to bring a lot of elements that you love. But I mean, Tysir Denmark, as we've, we put it to, uh, on this podcast a bunch, you really like the body of work that he's put together, uh, whether it's seven on seven circuit, Roman Catholic, uh, could be more nuanced receiver. But I, I think right now, you know, like a lot of what's already in place and with Peter Gonzalez, 
I'm right there with you. He's probably the name I circle on, on, on this entire class right now and saying when that 24 seven sports rankings update hits and, you know, the last week of October, first week of November, whatever it is after our guys get a long look at some senior film and after our guys get, get really start to adjust those rankings and signing day starting to be around the corner. Gonzalez is a name that we're going to be tracking because if, if what we witnessed uh, in this summer, I know he, he had a good day at the UC report. We, we both know he had a really good day in state college. If that, carries over and, and that's what he is going to be as a prospect as a player as a playmaker this season then that's that, that's the four-star kind of talent i mean i and i'm not the guy giving out the ratings or the stars around here and brian doan and our ratings council do a great job with that but because of where he's bouncing back of i caution anyone to look at this kid through 2022 colored glasses because he's just not that's not him that's not a good snapshot of who peter gonzalez is you were looking at a rising figure coming out of his sophomore season Teams were jumping on him going into that winter, and now you're looking at a guy who's kind of had a bit of a reset, and as he said, feels like he's going to you know, reemerge on this field as a different level athlete than the, the sophomore who was out there in 2021, and certainly the guy who was still hobbled a bit in 2022. So I'm right there with you. Uh, this is kind of the Peter gonzalez theme show, I guess. We started with 20-minute <laughs> conversation with him. We're finishing it here uh, with, with a longer look at him. And um, I, I wanted to finish generally on the podcast just for your thoughts. 2025, guys, they kind of been on the back burner for us because so much has been happening with 2024. We've got a list of, of prospects that we were impressed by during the June camps here at Penn State up at Lions 24-7. We dropped 55 names on offense on Saturday afternoon. Go check that out at lions247.com. We'll have our full rundown of defensive players that stood out today on monday july 3rd uh, but generally speaking a lot of 2025 names on that list and we're, those are the guys that we're going to start being talking about more and more i'm curious tyler calvaruso three stock up names in that 2025 cycle that nittany lions fans should be aware of there, save a little bit of room in your mind for some of those rising juniors as we're so fixated on the rising seniors these days for the first time, I'm going to have to go off that list. It's actually a guy that we saw at the uh, State College Elite 11 Regional in late May, and that would be Malik Washington, the quarterback from Archbishop Spaulding down in Maryland. He made it to campus for a visit right after that event concluded. And, I mean, there's really no doubt about it that he's high on the quarterback board at this point in the cycle. And it's kind of interesting because – Malik Washington is an elite level athlete, right? There's absolutely no doubt about that. He's a basketball player. He plays high level AAU ball. I mean, his athletic profile, he's tested very well everywhere he's been. He's not as refined as a lot of the quarterbacks we've seen Mike Gertz just go after on the recruiting trail and prioritize. But I mean, he might have some of the highest upside of any of those guys at the same time because he's gotten better mechanically. I got the chance to see Malik Washington, his first, I believe it was his first varsity actual regular season game start last fall and there were times where it was pretty clear that he had some improving to do but he also flashed some stuff where it's like wow i mean this guy with the athleticism he has and the natural arm strength he has there's something there if he could really refine things he could be a guy and he's getting very very close to that point in his development i think i think he's definitely shoring some things up and just really steadily improving as a prospect so i'd say he's stock up his recruitment hasn't really been that action-packed yet because he hasn't given a whole lot of thought to it. Like I, I mentioned, the basketball stuff, he's you know he's still focused on that as well, playing on the AAU circuit, so that's something that's factored in for him. But I think he's going to start to take more and more visits, and I think you're going to see him pop up at Penn State more and more regularly. He's already been to Happy Valley a bunch, but I think you're going to see it even more. And then now circling back, two guys from that list that you mentioned – Starting at wide receiver, Lex Cyrus, I feel like he just has to be a stock-up guy considering he makes it to the wideout camp without an offer and leaves with an offer. I mean, he was the best wideout that we saw during this year's wideout camp. I don't think uh, I don't think there's really much of a debate there, to be completely honest. I mean, with how well that he ran in the 40 before going to one-on-ones and torching pretty much every defensive back that he faced. I mean, Marcus Higgins was loving what he was seeing from Lex Cyrus on the pre- on, inside Haluba that day. And, I mean, that prompted the offer. So he's got to be a stock-up guy. I mean, I think he's definitely a legitimate Power 5 wideout prospect. I think you're going to be probably going to be talking about him more moving forward, you know, as a Harrisburg native playing to Susquehanna Township High. So he's one who – and then another one, I mean, at Penn State legacy, Mike Carroll, I think uh, – I think just be even beyond Penn State's interest, he's stock up. His whole recruitment is stock up at this point. I mean, he's camped around this summer, and he's gotten offers from pretty much every program where he's camped. Michigan State offered, South Carolina offered, Penn State offered. So 
you know, this his junior year is going to be a fresh start for him at a new high school. So it's going to be interesting to see how he acclimates and, you know, how he deals with his new surroundings, how he performs. But he's an intriguing prospect. He's a very intriguing prospect, just given what he we saw him accomplish in a camp setting. When you can pinpoint the kid, even, a, even an offensive lineman or a defensive lineman, when you can pinpoint the lineman as nasty in a camp setting with no pads on, I mean, that kind of speaks to the way he operates as a player. And Mike Carroll has that in him. And people will be happy to know that no one was nastier in, in the trenches this oh. entire June than Cooper Cousins, who was the first commitment in, in Penn State's 2024 class. So uh, carrying the mantle for the next offensive line class. What is Tossin another name there? Uh, I know it was a question for you, but why don't we, we kind of pair Josh Williams with Michael Carroll oh, since yeah, we're talking about sure. 2025 in-state offensive linemen. Both are sons of Penn, uh, of, of Penn State alums. One played for a football program. In Carroll's case, uh, Josh Williams' father did not. But trust me, a lot of Penn State love in that household. Another offensive lineman who seems to be getting offered wherever he went to camp this summer out of Haverford, Pennsylvania. Uh, so, uh, look, 2025, 2026 – 2026 might be the class to really yeah, know Pennsylvania class. as we, as we saw throughout June. And as we, as we kind of reinforced in our uh, big prospect rundown from June up at lines, 24, com. but appreciate some early feedback on, uh, as we get underway with July here on some of those 2025 names to know Penn state, a lot of work to do in that class. Mr. Calvaruso won't keep you any longer. Appreciate all the good stuff uh, throughout the month of June. We're into July now. Hopefully you get a little bit more downtime for yourself, but not too much because you've raised a high bar in our Nittany Lions fans at lines, 24, Four seven, gonna hold you to that. Yeah, we gotta keep it rolling, man. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Later. Great stuff from Tyler Calvaruso. Before him, Peter Gonzalez, a relatively new member of this 2024 recruiting class, one of the many additions in June. That's going to do it for this episode of the show. We'll be back later this week. We came to you a day early on a Monday due to the holiday. Hope everyone enjoys their 4th of July, wherever it takes you. We'll talk to you on Thursday with episode number two this week, uh, right here on the Lions 24-7 podcast. I'm Tyler Donahue. Thanks, as always, for listening or watching on YouTube.